Thank you, Chair, and good morning. And uh, thank you to IDSA and particularly uh, to Namrata Goswami for uh, organizing my somewhat problematic <laughs> trip here. Uh, getting a, uh, an Indian visa is not always as easy as it should be, especially if you need one of the conference visa types. Now, um, as most of you know, uh, I'm not uh, an expert on South Asian or Indian affairs, and it would be very foolish of me to stand up here and pretend in this kind of company uh, that I was that kind of expert. So I'm going to do something a little different from what uh, other speakers uh, have done here, although I hope to be able to set some of the discussion that we've had so far, and maybe some of the discussion that we're going to have, um, into a slightly different context from that uh, which it has taken so far. If I have a regional expertise or an area expertise, it's the world as a whole, right? So the world is my region. Um, and I'm therefore going to take um, a rather top-down, high-level view um, of the international system and the international society and where I think it's going. And I'm going to therefore start by telling you a story uh, about how I think this all started. That story relates to a book, uh, here comes the plug, um, it relates to a book which came out a few days ago that I've uh, written with George Lawson called, called The Global Transformation, which looks at the impact of the 19th century revolutions of modernity in making uh, contemporary uh, international society. So the basic argument of that book is that we are living downstream from the revolutions of modernity in the 19th century, um, and that international relations pays too little attention to this, and that if you do pay attention to it, it gives you a somewhat different feel uh, and a different positioning for understanding where we are now um, and how, other things being equal, uh, the international system is unfolding. Uh, and from that point of view, it looks as if we are at quite an important moment of transition. So I'm going to tell you the story, um, outline the consequences of this story, uh, then look a little bit at regions and a little bit at the emerging great powers uh, and some of the problems that I think the emerging system will have, and then try and raise a few questions um, out of that uh, for the position and role of, of India within it. So let me start then with the, uh, uh, the 19th century story. This is the driving story, if you like, um, and it's a fairly simple story in, in some ways, but its consequences are large, and we still live, as I say, downstream um, from this story. So the basic story here is that almost anything you care to think about of consequence in, uh, in relation to uh, the global system, uh, international relations, changed very dramatically during the 19th century. So there was a technological and industrial revolution, and most of you will know about that. Um, there was an ideational revolution in the sense that the principal organizing ideas for po human political life generally changed radically, um, and dynasticism and religion were pushed to one side, um, and new uh, ideologies of progress like liberalism and uh, socialism and nationalism and scientific racism, and we can discuss if you like why I think that was an ideology of progress, uh, but these ideas became very powerful in the 19th century, uh, and no equivalent ideas have arisen since. We are still living in the framework of those 19th century ideational revolutions. If you try to imagine what the 20th century would have looked like without nationalism, socialism, liberalism, and scientific racism, there's not a hell of a lot left. Hmm? Uh, basically, nothing happened in the 20th century if you take those, uh, those four ideas out. Right? So both materially in the sense of a shift to um, uh, industrial uh, economies, ideationally in terms of the uh, ideas of progress I've just, uh, I've just talked about, um, and also in terms of the, the construction of the system itself, um, the form of the modern national state, uh, came about during the 19th century, so the Westphalian state about which we talk so much is not the state 
that was uh, imposed upon the rest of the world by the Western powers. It was the modern national state uh, that came into being during the 19th century. So also did a very intense um, global economy. So one way of thinking about this story, um, I'm sure there are a few, uh, few Marxists out there still, uh, uh, this being India, uh, there's a nice Marxist concept from, uh, from Trotsky about uneven and combined uh, development. That sounds complex, but it's actually quite simple. Um, it basically says that development is always combined, i.e. everybody's economy is somehow, in some degree, linked to and affected by uh, everybody else's, um, and that this, uh, this development is always uneven, in the sense that some parts are more developed than others by the standard of the day. What happened in the 19th century was that some parts of the world became extremely uh, strongly developed and in a new way, uh, and that therefore opened up a very large power gap and created the extremely uneven form of international relations that uh, has been normal ever since. So it doesn't strike any of us as puzzling that a very small handful of countries should have been dominating the planet for the last couple of hundred years. It's just normal because that's what we've lived inside. But if you think about it, it's a bit odd that just a handful of countries should dominate the whole planet. And the reason for that is because of this extremely uneven uh, construction of power that came into being uh, in the 19th century. So the 19th century set up a world that was extremely combined in the sense that suddenly there was a, a very powerfully integrative global economy and extremely uneven in the sense that a small handful of countries dominated this and set the rules and led the way and imposed their will pretty much on everybody else. That transformation is the one that we are living downstream from uh, and the key argument I want to make is that we are, we are reaching a point now where the extreme unevenness that got put into place in the 19th century is beginning to level out. Right? So uh, any of you who, who have seen um, Farid Zakaria's book um, about the rise of the rest, nice phrase, I think. That's, if you think about what that phrase means, it means that the, uh, the rest, as it were, are beginning to catch up. They are finding their own way of coming to terms with the revolutions of modernity. Um, and, and this means that the unevenness, that the, the extreme unevenness that was put into place in the 19th century is beginning to level out. Okay? So we are moving towards a world in which power is going to be more evenly distributed and in which people have the same kind of power. It's not a small group that command industrial technology and modern power and then a larger group um, that are less developed and don't have that kind of power. Everybody is beginning to have this kind of power. And that, it seems to me, is where we need to start from in thinking about the sort of international system that we are in um, and how that's going to unfold in the coming future. And I'll set out a few basic principles for, uh, for this. I think the, uh, the system that we're going into, therefore, is going to be less and less uneven. Power is going to be more diffused, but it's going to be more and more combined. Right? There's no sense in which the global economy is disappearing or the, uh, the importance of shared fates, whether they be um, environmental fates or to do with uh, the ups and downs of the global economy, that combinedness, that connectedness is probably going to go on getting more intense. But the distribution of power within it is going to be uh, become more even. If you follow that logic, it leads you to a rather interesting proposition, um, something I've been arguing for the last few years, which is the logic of this direction is that we are heading for a world without superpowers. Um, we used to have three superpowers, then we had two, then we had one, uh, and that one is looking pretty wobbly as we, as we sit here. 
people are paying less attention to it, it is doing less, it is intervening less, it has less relative capability to control things, and that seems like a pretty powerful trend. Okay? But much of the argument that you find in international relations, and particularly in American international relations, is arguing about, uh, oh, well, are we going to have two superpowers? Um, because China is going to become a superpower and the US is going to remain one. Um, are we going to have maybe three superpowers if India comes up as well? Uh, how is this? Uh, it's still being talked about in terms of superpowers. Right? What I'm saying is, no, there are not going to be any more superpowers. We're going to lose the one we've got, like it or not, um, and therefore we're going to be in a world which has great powers and regional powers, but no superpowers. Now, we haven't been in a world like that ever okay? um, since the industrial revolutions of the 19th century and all of this, we have had superpowers. And therefore, we've got used to the idea that the world, world order, if you will, is going to be provided by a very small number of powers, whether one or two or three, um, that somehow uh, manage the system because they're big enough that it's in their interest to do so. And maybe they will also compete over the control of the system as they did uh, during the Cold War. But a world which has no superpowers but only great powers isn't going to look like that. Right? Nobody is going to want the job of managing the world. Okay? That's basically the definition of a world without superpowers. The Americans, although it's now embedded in their political DNA to want to run the world, are ceasing to be able to do so and are losing the legitimacy uh, to do so. Um, the Chinese say they don't want to run the world and don't want to be a superpower, and on this I believe them. I don't think they're arguing it for the same reasons that I am, but um, they don't want this job either. Um, India certainly doesn't want the job. The Russians aren't up to it. The EU isn't up to it. Nobody wants the job. Right? In a world of great powers, basically, nobody is going to be responsible for running the world. And that's the situation we need to think about. Okay? So that's, uh, that's where I'm going to head for. This world has uh, one or two other qualities about it, if you follow uh, the logic. One of them is that Ideo ideologically, um, it will have a narrower bandwidth than we've seen for a long time. Uh, the catchphrase here basically is that we are all capitalists now. Okay? We used to fight to the death about whether we, what, about capitalism or not, right? but now everybody is some version of capitalist. Chinese don't want to admit it, but you only have to spend five minutes in Shanghai to know that that's the sort of society that you're in. Okay? Maybe the Russians still haven't quite got capitalism and they may be in some danger of dropping back into some form of statist economy, but everybody else has got it. Right? That If you want to have wealth and power, which most people do, capitalism is the way you get it and it outruns all of the other ways. If there's one single lesson from the Cold War, it's that. Right? And pretty much everybody has got that lesson, and the Chinese got it uh, good and early on. So we have a narrower ideological bandwidth, which is a possible resource for us to play with in thinking about uh, world order. The other feature of this system, um, and here I'm a little, um, I don't have this clearly in, uh, in my mind, so I'm just going to talk around it, um, which is that if you have a world without superpowers, uh, but only great and regional powers, then probably you are looking at a more decentered kind of world, or to put it the other way around, a more regionalized kind of world, right? Where, um, for better or for worse, I'm not taking a normative position on this, but just saying this is the kind of world we're likely to be in, like it or not, um, that regions are likely to be more prominent um, politically, possibly even economically, uh, than they have been, and that the global level will tend to be a bit weaker because there's no superpower up there managing it and trying to make the, uh, make the system work on a global scale. 
So a world of, uh, of great powers and regional powers is probably going to be more decentered, and therefore there's going to be di more differentiated local uh, political and economic systems. If we start to think about that, um, the nature of uh, the regions, two things come to, uh, come to mind quite quickly. One is that, of course, regions are uh, constructed. Right? There's, there's nothing natural about regions. Uh, think, for example, of the discussion of regionalism in, in Asia. Uh, it's, uh, there's all kinds of different possibilities for, uh, for regions in Asia. Is South Asia the region, in which case you've got South Asia, Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia? Um, uh, or, or do we think about a pan-Asian region, a kind of super complex, a Sinocentric super complex? Um, do we think about the Indian Ocean? Do we think about the various constructions of Pacific regions, um, which include lots of Asia, and then make, that makes the United States part of Asia? Um, all of these are possibilities, not to mention the Australian question, are they part of, uh, of Asia or not? Um, there's all kinds of different versions of regions, and so, so there's nothing determined about regions. It's not a geographical concept here. Uh, which kinds of, of regions come into being is a bit hard to predict because there's a lot of possibilities out there. Looking around the, around the system, it's clear that there's a great diversity of types of region out there. Um, and this, it seems to me, is likely to remain the case. You can think about this diversity in different ways. Um, some regions have great powers in them and some don't. Right? So North America, for example, um, or you could compare North America and, uh, and South Asia uh, as being regions with one very big power in them and then a variety of much smaller ones. Um, or you could look um, at, uh, at Europe. If you think of the European Union as a power, then it has one big power which has kind of integrated most of the, uh, most of the region. Um, if you look at, at Asia, if you look at East Asia, it has two great powers. Uh, if you're thinking of all Asia, then three great powers, if you count India. Um, so some regions have one great power, some have more than one, and some have none. Right? The Middle East famously has no great power, um, Africa has no great power. So there's a whole variety of potential relations between, as it were, the local great powers and the regions. Um, the, these can take many forms. Some regions are, are consensual security communities, Europe and North America most obviously. Um, some are uh, consensual security regimes, uh, Latin America probably. Um, some are conflict formations, the Middle East most obviously. Uh, some people would still think of South Asia in that way. Uh, some are a kind of mixture, so East Asia is somewhere halfway between uh, the ideal types of, 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 of uh, a security regime and a conflict formation. Conflict is certainly possible, but there's a reasonable amount of security management, and there have been relatively few conflicts in, uh, in East Asia. So the regions are very diverse, and they relate to great powers in very diverse ways. But if a great power um, has a region, then, uh, in a sense, it, it's moving into a layered form of, of international relations in which it has a regional management issue level um, and also uh, what kind of role it's going to play at the global level. And the great powers need to start thinking about this because as the U.S. declines as a superpower, this a rather serious question as to who's going to do the global management problem. Um, local great powers will probably volunteer to do at least some degree of uh, the local order maintenance, but quite who, who's going to do it at the global level uh, remains an interesting question. So regionalism or regions are probably going to become more important, but, but it, it's very indeterminate. Uh, as to exactly what the shape of that will be, um, and it's going to take very different forms in very different places for the various uh, reasons that I've given. If we now look a bit um, at the nature of the rising powers, I'm focusing here um, on 
great powers. Right? I've got to simplify this in, in, uh, in some way. Um, there's some interesting features of the, as it were, the, the rising crop of, of great powers that certainly, and this is good news for India, <coughs> demography is back. Okay? Um, in the 19th century, a little country like mine, uh, with just a few tens of millions of people, could be a superpower, right? because power was so unevenly distributed, and if you didn't have the modern mode of power, you were hugely disadvantaged in relation to those who did. So population didn't matter all that much. You know, even Denmark could have uh, uh, an empire, and Belgium. Uh, and, and medium-sized countries like Britain and France could be global powers because of this differentiation. That differentiation is now disappearing. You can mark that with the, you know, the proliferation of nuclear weapons or the spread of industrial economies and modernity in, in general. There's all kinds of markers for it. But it's very clear uh, that, that this is happening. This means that great powers are going to be big. Right? So the current crop of likely great powers are all going to be big, and that's what poses uh, the problem for, uh, for Europe. Europe cannot really be a great power unless it has some kind of institutional uh, unification. All of the great powers um, are capitalist at the moment, which is quite a useful thing, I think, whether you like capitalism or not the mere fact of, of the homogeneity of this is a useful thing because we don't have these ideological contestations that we had in the 20th century about the basic form of the political economy. That issue seems to have been resolved. Most of them are nationalist. Uh, most of them are quite strongly sovereignist. Right? So this rising crop of, of great powers has a certain number of things in common. They also have some quite significant differences. They may all be capitalist, but they're not the same kind of capitalist. Right? So uh, there's a whole fascinating literature out there on the varieties of capitalism, and it's pretty clear, classical liberal thinking notwithstanding, that capitalism can go along with a lot of different political forms. Right? You can have an authoritarian capitalism like the Chinese, uh, have or the Saudis and uh, and others, or you can have um, a kind of liberal democratic capitalism like the U.S., or you can have a social democratic capitalism like most of Europe um, and Japan. Maybe India fits in there uh, as well. I'm not sure. Um, y y you can also have sort of mixtures like Russia, where it's not entirely authoritarian, but it's not exactly what you'd call dem democratic either, or at least the democracy is played on an extremely uneven field um, in which you don't get fair outcomes. But nonetheless, there is at least some semblance of democracy, unlike, say, in China, where democracy is simply not on, uh, on, uh, yeah, on the field at all. So all capitalists, but politically different, and that's going to be um, an important consideration. Um, do we want to emphasize the political differences amongst the great powers, or do we want to emphasize their, uh, their shared qualities in all being capitalist? There are, of course, um, uh, cultural and other differences that's uh, given, and that isn't going away um, at all fast. I think any of you who are still worried about modernization equaling westernization are wasting your time and energy and should move on to something more productive to worry about. Um, because it's pretty clear that capitalism comes in lots of different varieties. Um, and as uh, the rise of the rest uh, gets rolling, we can see that you know, capitalism can be fitted into all kinds of different cultural and political forms. Each cultural and political form has to work out its own accommodation uh, with capitalism, and that's what's going on around us now. But more and more people are finding ways of doing that, and that's why uh, the world is becoming less uh, uneven. Nonetheless, um, it does raise an interesting issue, um, which I think is going to become important, and I'm going to make this a bit of a, a, a theme in this, uh, in this talk, which is that uh, in the past, the fairly recent past, uh, from the 19th century onward, basically 
most of the great powers, virtually all of the great powers uh, uh, and superpowers, um, have been what we would call developed states, industrial states, states at the leading edge of wherever um, the, uh, the index of development is. Uh, so there's been a correlation. You've got, you've got to have been that, that kind of, of state in order to have qualified as a great power. The world we're moving into now um, is going to contain a different mix. Right? So there are going to be countries that are both great powers and developing countries. Now, the most obvious examples of this um, would be China and India and Brazil. And this, I think, poses some interesting problems um, because uh, I don't know quite so much about Brazil, but I know a fair bit about China. And um, from what I've heard of the foreign policy rhetoric in, in India, although the form of the words is different, the substance is the same. So basically, China and India uh, talk a line that says, we are developing countries still, but we are also great powers and we want that status, right? but we're developing countries and therefore we want that status too. Right? Um, so we're also huge populations, so we have, you know, we're, we're responsible for a big chunk of humankind, which is true, right? And therefore, it's really as much as we can do to take responsibility for developing ourselves, and that's our contribution to global order. Right? Uh, don't ask us to do anything else. Right? Um, that, that's a line you get very clearly out of China, and uh, I think you get a very similarly, a similar line out of India, but differently worded. And we need to think very carefully about the implications of that, because this combination of, I want to be a great power, I want recognition, uh, great power status, but I also want to stay as a developer. Even the Chinese are still hanging on to developing country status. I mean, it's embarrassing. But there are some political advantages in it, and so they do. And India will do the same, for sure. How do you mix these two things, though? This, this I think, um, is going to be one of the big problems going forward. I have a way of thinking about this, um, which is a slightly odd way. Um, do, do most of you know what autism is, the, the kind of developmental condition where an, individual, uh, an, an individual's behavior is dominated much more by what goes on in, inside him or herself than what than, than in relating with other people. So autistic individuals tend to have problems developing a social life or a set of social relationships. And I think this uh, is a useful analogy for the kind of international system that we're moving into, because most of the great powers are going to display quite strong autistic tendencies. In other words, their behavior is going to be much more driven by what's going on inside them than it is by their relationships with other countries. This is true for uh, the developing country great powers for the reasons I just mentioned. They're self-obsessed with their development, which is perfectly legitimate, okay, um, and don't want to take on uh, wider responsibilities. But the existing set of great powers is worn out, exhausted, and introverted, right? So the Americans are turning in, uh, uh, the Europeans have already turned in, and, and uh, have not yet worked out how to make a collective foreign policy of any great uh, consequence. Um, so we are perhaps facing a situation in which, as it were, the community of great powers is going to be a bit autistic. That all of its members are going to be more internally self-obsessed than they are going to be outward looking and concerned about managing the system. Um, and that, it seems to me, is going to be a significant problem going forward. The danger of that kind of system is that uh, international society ends up uh, becoming very weak because nobody is taking on the managerial responsibilities uh, uh, of the system level. And the system level does need managing. There are plenty of shared fate problems out there ranging from the environment to the management of the global economy, which none of us is going to escape. Right? So we cannot escape the issue that the world needs a decent amount of management. 
And I, if my argument is correct, we cannot escape um, the issue that there's no longer going to be a superpower or superpowers to do that management. There's only going to be a coterie, a mixed bag of great powers, none of which wants the job of global management. So the logic of this, I think, is fairly clear. Um, if, uh, if this group of great powers says we don't want to get involved in global management, then the system will be seriously undermanaged and these collective problems will not go addressed. Um, if, on the other hand, they want to get together and, and form some kind of international society, then there are real uh, possibilities for a concert of capitalist powers would be my, uh, my, my kind of ideal outcome. Uh, one in which the great powers would all recognize and accept the fact that they are indeed capitalists and that that gives them a strong set of shared interests at a very minimum in managing the world economy. Um, I can't think of any of the of the major powers that has any interest in disrupting the global economy at the moment. They're all dependent on it um, and if it goes down then they all go down and their development projects all go down together. So that would be the ideal outcome. But that requires um, what Hedley Bull uh, referred to as responsible great powers. Powers that are um, accepting of what Adam Watson called raison du système, the idea that it pays to make the system work. Okay. This is, as it were, the counterpoint to raison d'état, which is that uh, you uh, judge your behavior only by the particular immediate uh, national interest that you have. So one needs this counterpoint between raison d'état and raison de système. And the question is whether we're going to get this or not. There's all manner of, um, of other things that we might think about in, in here. Uh, and happy to talk about it in, in the Q&A, but I don't have time to go into it now. There's obviously a need for institutional reform, and we are beginning to see something of that in the sense that it looks like it's going to be impossible to reform the Security Council uh, and the existing institutions, and the American uh, Congress is not going to allow meaningful reforms to the IMF and the World Bank and other such like. And therefore the BRICS and others are beginning to set up counterpoint institutions of their own and we're going to be in some kind of strange institutional flux where it isn't clear that we've got functioning legitimate global level organizations. Quite how this is going to pan out I don't know but it's part of the equation of this transformation uh, point that we're looking at where the rise of the rest is evening out um, the uh, the global distribution of power and therefore bringing to an end the period of Western dominance which hinged um, on uh, the revolutions of the 19th century. Now, let me uh, conclude this by trying to make a few points about um, what the significance of this might be for India. If you accept the broad picture that I'm painting and then try and locate um, India in there. What do we get? Um, I think there are uh, things can be thought about on three levels here. There are domestic things, there are regional things, and then there are global things. Um, so on the domestic uh, level, I think the autism question is one that India needs to think about hard. Okay. Um, because its natural tendency is going to be to be one of those autistic powers that is more self-obsessed um, and not wanting to take on uh, uh, larger responsibilities. Uh, many people make the invidious comparison of the Indian diplomatic service with that of Singapore and the Singaporeans come out better. Uh, this is a very a commonplace remark. This needs to be addressed. Right? Um, if India is going to play a great power role, it needs to have a great power diplomatic service. Um, I don't think there are any questions about the quality of the Indian diplomatic service, but there are serious questions about the size of it. Um, and the kind of world into which we are moving uh, needs to be one in which countries are uh, very well diplomatically equipped, because this is going to be, I hope and I think, 
um, a world in which diplomacy will be a lot more important than war. Right? Uh, great powers are not going to define themselves by beating other great powers in war. They're going to define themselves through their diplomatic activities in structuring international society and being, uh, and being responsible members of that society. We had some discussion yesterday about ideas, um, wh whether um, India has a kind of grand scheme of things or a grand strategy, uh, and there are, there are clearly some things floating around, but those need to be firmed up. And exactly the same remark could be made about, about China. You know, what does China want? You know, I don't know. Nobody knows. It wants 15 different things, most of which contradict the, the, the other 14. Um, so there, is, there isn't a great coherence in it, um, and the same is true, I think, in the case of, uh, of India. But India has a particular problem, because if, if I'm right in thinking that uh, the world we're moving towards is a more regionalized world, then the question is, what is India's region? Um, and that question has lots of different answers. Uh, now, that suggests to me that some hard thinking needs to go on in India about the scope of the region or regions um, within which India wants to play. Um, the, the South Asian region question has been around for a long time. Um, uh, you know, the, the India doesn't seem to be very interested in, in dominating its region or managing its region, so can it transcend its, its region? Or is its region going to be a drag on its aspirations to great power status? I think both are true. Um, uh, India can probably transcend its region, but the region is still going to be a drag on its great power status because it's embarrassing to have a, um, a backyard as messy as the one that, uh, that India has, and it can be occasionally problematic. Does India want to sort of follow the, uh, the Curzon vision and, and make itself an Indian Ocean power, um, in a sense reconstructing the role it had um, when, the, when the British were running the place? The, the, the kind of look east, act east policy is clearly part of that vision, and, and there's quite a lot of that uh, of that going on. Um, that would imply a more navalist um, view of the, the armed forces and such like, um, and, and and acting on a considerably wider scale. And there's evidence that India is uh, is playing on that scale. And then there's the all Asia scale. Um, that's generally thought of as being some kind of Sino-centered um, security complex in which Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Central Asia are all, in some sense, being drawn into um, a, a China-centered system, both uh, strategically and, and economically. This is a, a, a very um, important dynamic to understand, and India is clearly being drawn into this to, to some extent. Um, but there are some oddities about this. Uh, within the, the, the larger Asian sphere, uh, there are still um, countries that are um, wedded to older traditions of hierarchy, if I can put it that way. Um, so Confucian cultures are naturally inclined towards um, hierarchy. Uh, I think you can see the same in, in Russia. Russia is behaving like an old-fashioned empire, okay? and up to a point um, so is China, although China's behavior is very mixed, but there's certainly an, uh, uh, an, an, an imperial element in there. That line of Chinese rhetoric that says we should have primacy in Asia um, is a kind of imperial line of rhetoric. Uh, the Chinese will deny this, they, they hate nothing more than being referred to as imperialists, but they're going to have to get used to it, um, because in some respects uh, uh, the behavior fits. On the other hand, um, Asia is also a place where there's an extremely strong commitment to sovereignty, non-intervention, sovereign equality. These are contradictory principles um, in many ways, and therefore the, the one thing, the one clear thing you can say uh, about, about Asia as a whole is that it has no shared principles of political legitimacy, and that's going to make life a bit difficult when it comes to defining some kind of international society on a regional scale uh, or an all Asian scale. It's going to have to be very pluralist and very tolerant of 
difference, uh, more so than, say, uh, has been the case in the Western developments um, like the EU and, and other such like. It's a different political game that has to be played here. On the global level, I think, therefore, and I'll end with this, um, the I think the key way to think about the global level, perhaps, from an Indian perspective, is to pick on the term multipolarity. Right? Um, India is one of those countries that likes the term multipolarity and uses it frequently. Um, it, there's plenty of company in this, the Chinese like it too, and so do the Russians and even the French at points and the Iranians and a variety of others. And the term, you know, the, the general rhetoric is we want a more multipolar world. Right? Now, that can be read as shorthand for we don't want an American dominated world. Okay? Um, but whether you like it or not, you're not going to have an American dominated world for much longer because America is clearly losing the capability and the legitimacy to play that superpower global managing role. Right? So uh, for all of those of you who've, who've waved the multipolar flag, your bluff is going to be called. Right? Um, you're going to get this world whether you like it or not. And the question is, what sort of world do you want that to be? Right? And I have not seen much in the way of discussion about what a multipolar world should look like from a Chinese or Indian or Russian or other perspective, other than that the Americans should not be dominant. Right? So if the Americans are just even down to first amongst equals or just equals, what is this world going to look like, a multipolar world? Right? If it's a world of autistic great powers, it's not going to be very pretty. If it's a world of, of what uh, the English school refers to as responsible great powers, then there is some hope for it, um, because as I've said, all the great powers are capitalist and they, and they all share the same set of fates about terrorism, about uh, the global environment, about disease transmission, about the management of the global economy. They're all bound up in this, so there are good reasons for them to cooperate and fewer political ideological reasons for them not to. So I think this is the choice really and this is the thing that needs to be talked about. Um, is India going to be one amongst a group of autistic great powers under managing the system or is it going to be a responsible great power and part of a, um, a concert of capitalist powers? Thank you for listening.